Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Hadrat Pochash, as Mario introduced. Uh, I'm tech lead in DeFi research and risk applications for Alterscope now. Uh, we have today very valuable like, uh, people in the space that is working towards uh, risk analysis and making the DeFi more safe, I guess. Uh, like Watson, you have a great talk, but uh, for the rest, I guess it like, would uh, be great if you can introduce yourself briefly to our audience. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thanks for being here. I know it's like uh, sunny outside and there's like a bunch of cats to be pet. Uh, so my name is Khaled. Uh, I think I'm like a relatively newcomer on the panel. I started in crypto like in uh, May 2022 professionally. Uh, I started at uh, Abbey and I was working uh, as a quant. Uh, there I was uh, reviewing uh, methodologies and parameters from uh, providers like uh, Gauntlet. Uh, I also contributed to uh, Go. Uh, goes initial parameters and also designing the GSM. And my main uh, mission was kind of like uh, developing a simulation platform, um, both the software and the models. And now uh, I'm, uh, I work on risk at uh, Block Analytica. And the latest thing that we've announced is uh, that we're gonna be launching uh, Metamorpho Vaults, uh, Ethan USDC with the B protocol. So uh, if you're interested in learning more, reach out. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Yakov Barinsky. I'm the founder of a uh, company called Hash CIB. Uh, we are a lucky early investor in Solity Network, so happy to be Alterscope, as I must call it from today, right? Uh, sorry, I'm still in yesterday. Um, yeah, and uh, happy to be here. We primarily focus on investing in early stage uh, companies in the space uh, with a specific focus on DeFi. We used to run our own DeFi fund, uh, uh, which is maybe a story we'll touch upon uh, throughout this session. Um, so that's how we initially met uh, with uh, Alterscope. And um, uh, we feel like a lot of those things that the team is working on could be very useful uh, for someone like us back in the days when <laughs> we were running the DeFi fund and hopefully in the future as well, as we will relaunch uh, the V2 of it. Uh, so yeah, happy to be here and happy to join the panel. Um, then, like, I can start with my first, uh, first, first question uh, on economic security, uh, which is the main subject of our panel discussion today. Um, so, in your own terms, like, how would you define the economic security for individuals, maybe also as well as businesses in this uh, DeFi landscape? Uh, sure. So I'm probably going to approach it from like uh, the DeFi protocols perspective. I think there's like a couple of ways to define like uh, economic security. Um, so one of them is like in a, an adversarial setting. Um, uh, economic security is basically like uh, making sure that uh, the cost of attacking, manipulating, or extracting the value from the protocol is uh, higher than whatever you can get out of it. <laughs> or uh, if it's uh, hard to estimate, uh, back of back of the envelope math. Hello. Yeah, uh, if it's like really hard to estimate, uh, back of the envelope math should like basically give you humongous numbers to exploit protocols. Uh, second, uh, it's like uh, in normal market regimes or in stress test scenarios, uh, the protocol should be should fare well, uh, both from the pro protocol's perspective and also from the user's pers perspective, as much as the protocol allows. Uh, yeah, just just to add to that, uh, when you think about economic security, it always has to do with liquidity and the availability of that liquidity. So whenever you're interacting with the uh, DeFi protocol, it should be very transparent uh, how that liquidity is comprised and uh, whether uh, there is enough of it for different uh, stress events, for different uh, um, scenarios when, uh, uh, like, there is a significant price shift or there is a significant uh, liquidity shift that it will be able to sustain it. Uh, so that's the important part that we have burned our ourselves on uh, back in the days. Uh, yeah, no, I think so. Um, I think both of those answers are, are uh, definitely very valid. Um, I think that, yeah, between adversarial attacks, understanding sort of the general risks of the ecosystem, uh, that covers 
probably 95% of, of, of what's important in the space. I think the one thing I would add to is, I think economic security is actually heavily tied, in our opinion, uh, to like growth as well, right? Because uh, if you want to remove risk from a protocol or ecosystem, uh, if a protocol has zero TBL, there's actually zero risk, right? Um, uh, again, this is a bit tongue in cheek, but uh, I think that understanding how you can maximize growth is also something that's relatively important to protocols. Uh, so pushing the bounds of uh, not just the lower bound of liquidity you need for maybe liquidations, but also understanding, hey, these are some of the uh, explicit trade-offs that you need for uh, sort of uh, optimizing for user experience, which again is uh, if you sort of just remove, uh, yeah, sort of the, the uh, loss of your private keys or uh, sort of silly things, you can also think about like MEV and how uh, a user can uh, be exposed to, to specific risk vectors because they're less sophisticated. And so I think from, from those two angles, like understanding uh, how you can optimize growth, which is very important to, to economic security, in my opinion, as well as like the individual user side, which is understanding if they can take advantage of maybe some interest rate regime or uh, set up in a protocol is, is relatively important to sort of round out the, the, the thoughts about uh, yeah, economic security. Thanks for your answers. Um, the, like, uh, the next question for me would be like uh, the economic risk that many protocols on the DeFi are taking right now is kind of uh, uh, conservative. That like there are some margins of improvements in um, the uh, usage scale, um, the liquidity usage scale of the protocols. How to say? Uh, so how do you see the role of the companies that assess risk on the DeFi? Uh, to push the boundaries for these protocols uh, to operate more, I don't know, efficiently or like bringing more liquidity available, etc. Yeah. Uh, sure. So, I'm not sure that uh, actually DeFi conservative uh, DeFi protocols are really conservative. Um, so I'll give you like a quick example. Uh, say you have some Apple stock, uh, three trillion market cap, appro approximately, uh, twelve billion dollars of trading volume per day on average. Uh, you go to like a, an investment bank, you're going to get at most 40% LTV. Now you take ETH, it's like 250 mi uh, billion market cap, 12 billion of uh, average trading volume. You go to any lending DAP and you get 85 plus percent LTV. So um, now the question is like, uh, are we wrong? Are the bankers wrong? Uh, is there like more at play because crypto kind of like trades more on that stuff or no? Uh, so I, I feel like that question is like uh, a bit murky. One point though where like um, uh, it's clear that there's margin for efficiency is um, basically like um, I think right now what's kind of missing from lending and LPing and all that stuff is really um, uh, different terms for different users. So if you go to Aave, everybody gets the same terms. If you go to Maker, everybody gets the same terms and so on. And I think like uh, the next step for lending is going to be fine-tuning that stuff uh, to like a, um, a lender that's like a bit more conservative or like a borrower that's more risky is going to be more charged a bit more and if he's like very safe and he rebalances often uh, that's going to be like uh, better and so uh, on what the role of like um, uh, companies that assess risk is uh, I think uh, our role is not to really push boundaries at all uh, I think the role of like uh, uh, risk management firms uh, really is just like um, to explain the risks as we understand them and to lay them out to like uh, stakeholders and uh, basically uh, explain all of the uh, consequences as we understand them and for them to choose from there. And I think like that's the approach that you take, right? Like there's always like these like three propositions. There's like a, a very conservative, medium and low risk. And I think that's kind of like the role that like uh, risk managers should have really. Uh, now, if you have like a different role, that's a bit different. If you're like managing uh, a metapho metamorpho vault, for example, I think it's more like sticking to your guns, meaning like uh, if you say that the vault is um, blue chip and uh, low risk, then sticking to that and to the definition that you have, because y you have a point of view, right? We all have a point of view, like uh, what's risky and what's not. Uh, it's different than like a DAO setting where you expose the stuff, you expose the consequences and they choose from it. And when you're actually 
the one that has the, the keys basically. Yeah. So yeah, I also give an example from what we're doing in terms of risk assessment when we were running our uh, DeFi fund. Uh, so we essentially came up uh, with a proprietary system that had to like constantly screen and analyze uh, all the different uh, protocols out there. And uh, I think uh, what we're missing a lot is uh, every company, every manager, if we're talking about funds or uh, even protocols, they have their own uh, methodology with how, uh, how they evaluate risks. And that is usually highly customizable. So uh, in the sense that you'll need a lot of parameters and they will always differ uh, from uh, one approach to another. But what we're really lacking is a set of tools that would allow us to quickly launch the methodology that we had and like not have to build it our own or like stack it on uh, mm, top of each other. So um, I think that the companies that are focused on risk assessment right now in the DeFi space should be thinking about that, how to provide that whole Lego for the uh, proprietary teams that could then take parts of it and uh, recreate the product uh, on their side. That would definitely be very helpful. Yeah, I tend to agree with that as well. Um, trying to piggybacking off the initial point. Uh, I also, uh, you can argue if the parameters in the ecosystem are conservative or not. Uh, but the community, I will tell you for sure, is not conservative uh, because every single time we try to risk off, uh, I get Link Marines DMing me on Twitter, calling me dumb. Uh, I, I, and I also think that like, I, I remember one explicit example too when uh, I first started working at Gauntlet because we were sort of the, the sole sort of risk uh, provider for both Compound and Aave. Um, and I think this was uh, middle of 2021. Uh, we sort of went to Compound and said, hey, we saw specific liquidity changes in WBTC. We also see specific user um, uh, changes. We think that right now it might make the most sense to uh, decrease collateral factor, right? Um, there was a lot of pushback from the community. A lot of people were mad at us. Um, and moreover, I think that uh, it was one of the most contentious sort of compound uh, proposals that even to this day was put up. I think we barely passed with like 60% uh, yes rate. Um, and then I think two weeks later, there was a huge downturn in WBTC, which again uh, is a bit lucky. I'm not going to say uh, sit here and say we predicted the WBTC price would go down. But the impact on user positions and what had happened because we had dropped the collateral factor was that there was only 10% of liquidations on the protocol than there would have been if we had made no changes, right? Um, this is a scenario where I think, like everyone has said before, what actually enables the correct decision making and pushing parameters to their sort of upper bound is making sure you provide the community with the correct trade-offs. And, and like I said before, like the correct objective function, right? Um, you might actually not care that much about how much is liquidated. You might not care about these other metrics that are sort of uh, ways to diagnose risk uh, because you would rather have just more TVL. And if that's the case, uh, if that's what you're trying to optimize for, which in in the case of some lending protocols is the optimization function you want, uh, making those correct trade-offs in the right ways with as much information as possible is sort of the, the role of risk, risk uh, assessors and risk managers in the space. Um, yeah. Thanks for your answers. Uh, I think the next question on the Okay, no touching from the microphone, I guess. Uh, uh, the next question on me would be like about economies of scale on the DeFi. Um, like, I felt due to some circumstances the, the risk is on a bit conservative on the DeFi, but like it's open to discuss, I guess like uh, we can do it uh, later. Uh, so I feel like it's also the economies of scale is a bit far away in terms of the real usage and adoption of the DeFi in the real world today. Uh, what factors do you believe uh, will help DeFi to provide economies of scale in uh, like business and also maybe reaching the mass adoption in everyday life? Before? Yeah. Uh, so I'll answer the mass adoption bit first. I think like uh, for mass adoption, really like uh, first is like uh, US, UX use cases uh, that are like uh, the most important thing and also kind of like a, a better perception of crypto overall uh, would help. And uh, on economies of scale, I think like, um, so right now uh, crypto is like a bit over 1 trillion market cap. 
and that's including like whatever, everything, all of the tokens, all of the TVL and everything. Uh, most GSIBs have like uh, over one trillion in assets. And so uh, I think like um, to kind of like reach economies of scale, we kind of like uh, need a, a connection to the real world. And uh, there's been a push for like uh, the RWAs uh, recently. And I think like uh, the most successful like example of that is uh, SDI and makers like uh, uh, the first protocol to kind of like generate like uh, 150 million in a year just from treasuries. So I think like uh, moving towards uh, this type of stuff uh, safely uh, because we've seen like with the, the USDC kind of like uh, uh, situation how dangerous it can be, uh, especially since like uh, everything is uh, interconnected. Uh, and how you make it safe is like uh, by going like the closest you can to the tap, meaning like uh, exactly what Circle did after uh, the debug. Uh, they basically like uh, switch all of their banking to uh, uh, BNY Mellon. And so uh, the closer you can get to the tap and uh, the better it is because uh, <laughs> basically if there's a risk with your protocol, it means that there's a risk with like the whole US dollar complex, let's say, if you're dollar denominated. Uh, now uh, on DeFi protocols themselves, I think like uh, liquidity is like a big part of it and growth. Uh, I think like uh, we need like a <laughs> higher prices and more liquidity uh, because most DeFi protocols uh, barely generate <coughs> revenue, if at all. And if they generate revenue, usually it's just exactly enough to pay service providers. Um, so I think like to reach economies of scale, we need like a, a bit more liquidity, uh, more connected to uh, the real world and uh, in a safe way. Um, yeah. Um, yes, I think uh, at the moment the uh, key hurdle for further growth of the DeFi ecosystem is actually the yield that you can generate there because if we go back to three years ago to the DeFi summer when the treasury rates were almost at zero uh, and uh, the DeFi yields, you could easily get uh, high double digit returns uh, with relatively low risk. Right now, it's an inverse situation when the treasury yields are extremely high and the DeFi yield is extremely low. And uh, therefore, there is no incentive at the moment for any capital to flow into the DeFi ecosystem because if you talk to any large asset manager in TradFi, they'll tell you that they will generate the same or higher returns through highest uh, rank <laughs> ranking bonds uh, just by leveraging them maybe two, three times. And that will already be double digit returns compared to high single digit that you can probably get in DeFi relatively lo uh, low risk or risk free oh, sorry, low risk today, not risk free, sorry. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the one big thing is purely economic uh, driver behind that. The second thing is of course, uh, what everyone is talking about and why everyone is probably in this space, which is the, the tooling and the infrastructure that you can provide uh, for this uh, more traditional capital to come into the market. But that has been the story from the first day uh, in this market and will probably be until the end. Uh, but uh, yeah, on this on this part, I just think that some, um, some good uh, new standards, like uh, um, some, something you can coin as a standard that then Bloomberg or FactSet or all of those kind of uh, thread <laughs> via Web2 service providers would implement and uh, use you as a, as a reference point, uh, be it just the, the pricing, uh, the volatility or any other uh, combination of that, that is definitely something that is to be built and implemented uh, so that whenever you turn on uh, the TV, uh, uh, then you'll have like this sort of metrics just flowing there. Uh, that's something that is necessary. And of course the uh, ETF approval yeah um yeah up only is is good for the space i think uh in, in my opinion too i think this is something that was discussed in the last panel um but sort of having the correct security not just economic security but general security for for players like fidelity to step into the space i think is a huge step for for mass adoption right like that's this just a large flow of assets this large flow of uh, sort of various uh, different market participants. And I think that like uh, the way that you sort of view the economies of scale and the benefits that you get from that type of 
asset allocation uh, can't be understated, right? Um, and I think that, yeah, a lot of the, the things that were discussed here as well um, uh, play into that. I would also say that like uh, the, the DeFi markets still are uh, pretty inefficient. Um, I think the interest rate example is a relatively good one uh, during yeah, DeFi summer and, and sort of the, the craziness there. Uh, interest rates were definitely not efficient. Uh, I think that uh, going forward to um, understanding how you can design sort of more robust uh, ecosystems, not just protocols. Um, I, I think the, the Arbitrum ecosystem has, has taken steps there too, uh, like trying to think about and understand sort of how various players fit into the space and, and how they'll think about uh, risk holistically and, and how to incentivize sort of the correct growth and development uh, in the space is relatively important. And so, yeah, between the two things there, it's, it's uh, yeah, getting getting the, the big boys to come into the space and then, and then uh, yeah, driving efficiency through thinking about the, the economics and, and growth in specific ways. Okay, <clears throat> it's all fine, right? Okay, great. Um, thanks for your answers uh, once more. Uh, so now the lending markets of it. Uh, the lending markets function with the over collateralized loans uh, as of today, if not all of them, most of them. Um, so I believe it limits the amount of liquidity that is available over the space that can be um, that can be achieved much more in the centralized systems with the banks and stuff. So uh, the, what are the obstacles, uh, to your opinion, uh, for lending markets to provide under collateralized loans, um, and what roles do, uh, do you um, see the risk assessment companies? Could uh, take part in uh, solving these obstacles. Uh, yeah. uh, so I think like uh, the the biggest stop to um, under collateralized lending is like really um, an efficient way to enforce like uh, penalties on chain without holding assets. Uh, and I haven't seen like a clear way to do it just yet because uh, I don't know. First, like there's like the time component, which is like uh, the speed of the legal system is like. Uh, very slow compared to liquidations um, and so I think like as long as there's like a way to enforce like uh, penalties without holding assets on chain over collateralized lending is like not going to be a thing uh, however like uh, coming back to the efficiency thing I think there's still stuff to be done uh, even without like thinking about like uh, over collateralized lending um, under collateralized lending so uh, I think like there's uh, improvements to be made like as I mentioned earlier on like uh, the terms that you can offer users so if they behave like uh, in a certain way you can give them like a uh, cheaper rates uh, you can give them like better uh, LTVs but we still have to hold like uh, the assets uh, and um, I think like uh, if you someday have like uh, this way of like uh, impugning penalties without holding assets uh, then we're gonna come back to like uh, these models of like uh, what's the probability of like uh, that these uh, users actually default and that type of stuff I think like uh, uh, by that point we'll basically like uh, be building like uh, really banks right because it's going to be running like uh, under collateralized lending and uh, most of the assets are not going to be there and the primitives will have to change dramatically right because um, how are you going to like uh, liquidate a loan if you don't have the assets to back it and uh, you're gonna have to like build like a, uh, a lot of infrastructure to kind of like uh, penalize instantly um, and yeah to be honest I, I don't see it happening like for at least a couple of years but the thing that's like really reachable I think is like uh, giving like better terms uh, to users depending on like their um, uh, behavior on chain and I think like uh, we have like a int uh, project internally called the uh, project Levon. And it's basically like uh, classifying users and their behavior. And I think that's going to be like uh, something that's going to go in that direction. Yeah. yeah so if I may ask uh, with, a, <laughs> with a question to the, uh, to the audience, uh, what do you think is like the most uh, common use case for lending today? Uh, so what's that? No, no, I mean for, uh, for like, What's the most common use case on Aave, for example, when you um, grow yeah, up to buy a much. house? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, you just trading. You just buy more more of crypto for the crypto that you borrow, right? So you uh, deposit your ETH and then get USDC and buy more ETH. Uh, and I don't think that's uh, a very good model uh, to finance uh, if you're a bank or any other uh, credit institution. Uh, and uh, uh, definitely not in an under collateralized manner. Uh, because uh, that will lead you to liquidation very, very quickly or to bankruptcy. Uh, but of course, I agree with, with everything you said in, in regards to user profiling. And uh, it's definitely um, the data side of things uh, that has to improve uh, before even uh, kind of going into this uncollateralized model. Uh, that's 100%. But I think even even more importantly, it doesn't really make sense like, except for this mo <laughs> most common use case that I just referred to, it doesn't really make sense to use your super liquid or absolutely liquid assets as a collateral because it doesn't really happen in real life. When you think about when you take a loan in real life, you, you never like bring your dollars to the bank to get a loan in Euro. Uh, you, you, that's just non-existent. You either get an, just a loan in Euro and don't give the bank anything or you can use your house or something else as a collateral uh, in order to get the loan. Uh, and the, so, of course, the answer is in some shape or form, RWA. And we're seeing a huge growth uh, over the last few months uh, in terms of some new assets entering entering this, um, this field, in most things still financial instruments, but at least it's not cash anymore. So I think we made this very, very tiny step from just cash, with, which effectively ETH or BTC is, uh, to something else and uh, that is ultimately the way forward for this under collateralized market to grow uh yeah i i, I think i tend to agree with most of that as well um because i think sort of a, a potential way to to think about what they just said is like a credit score right that's effectively what you want um again there's sort of a lot of different uh potential civil attacks or the ability to sell an account or a wallet that has more favorable terms there's sort of a lot of uh, potential issues with that and so i i'm in agreement that, that yeah like under collateralized loans uh the way that you think about it from like a cdp uh such as maker or like a lending protocol such as Ave's perspective we're probably pretty far off uh but if you think about uh the actual use case and what you're trying to do which is like it was just mentioned, get more leverage, uh, you actually technically already have these things, right? Like if you want to use the perps protocol, if you want to use sort of like Morpho or various other protocols that uh, sort of set up various ways of you getting more exposure than you want, could have had with the assets that you have, that's sort of already available. Um, and so if you just want to turn your uh, uh, crypto native assets to stable coins uh, in a ratio that is higher than what you could before, uh, yeah, I, I think we're pretty far off there. But if you think about the various other use cases, I think there are solutions that are being built already. Um, uh, just a side note on the lending that happens when you go uh, to a bank or something. It's not really under collateralized though. Like if you go to a bank and you take a mortgage to, a mortgage to buy a house, like they're going to have the house if you don't pay back, right? And there's like, if you don't pay your loan, then you're going to be kind of like marginalized from society. There's going to be like uh, somebody that's going to come to your house to claim the loan and all that stuff. So uh, even like uh, what happens today, like uh, when you go to a bank or something, is actually over collateralized. Either you put your reputation at risk or your well-being because it's your house, right? So how do you quantify your reputation? You definitely put it at risk uh, on chain. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks for the answers as well as the discussion. Uh, um, in your answer, Khaled, actually, you said like um, um, the classifying to on-chain behavior to um, uh, decide without showing the collateral itself so it can help to reach the under collateralization as well. So actually, like this is kind of probabilistic approach with like maybe uh, uh, both probabilistic approaches and the uh, machine learning can be helpful to create this advanced uh, data analytics and the simulation cases as well as without uh, using the assets itself to, I don't know, prove something. Um, so, um, so, but uh, in the nature of both probabilistic uh, approaches as well as the machine learning, it is like um, 
just the expected values. It is not like a certain deterministic results that we are getting. So what could go wrong while applying these kind of algorithms in um, risk assessments uh, or on DeFi? And how could these unforeseeable um, uh, results uh, can be prevented? Yeah. Uh, sure. So um, on the conse consequences first, uh, I think like uh, there's like a spectrum of consequences. Uh, there's a difference between like um, freezing the PSM and basically stopping trading uh, on protocol owned liquidity versus a gelato bot that says like that sets uh, a liquidation loan to value to zero. Uh, so the consequences are like uh, it depends on the cons on consequences a little bit. Uh, and so uh, how do you go about like uh, implementing that stuff? How do you deal with like uh, the fact that uh, it's probabilistic and everything? I think like uh, Good practices go a long way. Um, so first, uh, whenever you have like a complex systems, uh, probabilistic machine learning, all that stuff, uh, that's not easy to explain or doesn't use like a simple math. Uh, it's better to have that stuff on the edge of the protocol rather than at the core of the protocol, and for it to have like a, at least a time lock uh, to have like a access to critical components. Um, and uh, for any other stuff like uh, I don't know rate mechanisms or all that. I think like uh, uh, it's somewhat fine because the value that you can extract from it is like not as clear. Um, yeah, and what was the question? The complete? Uh, what can these like uh, unexpected results of these um, uh, uncertain algorithms can uh, expose the DeFi into some risks and how to prevent those kind of risks? Yeah. Okay, so uh, um, I don't know. Uh, or I, I'll give you a story, okay. Uh, so there was like a lot of like uh, stuff going on uh, at Ave with like a uh, curve and everything, right? There was two situations. There was uh, the Ivar Eisenberg situation, and then there was like the Viper exploit. Uh, so the thing is like uh, during the latter one, um, basically you kind of like uh, saw uh, who were the winners really, like in lending in like worst case situations. Um, I think like uh, the user in question had like uh, 60 million USDT of debt on Aave V2 and he was like a prolific user of DeFi and so he had like a bunch of like uh, loans on other protocols as well. Um, and then the Viper exploit happened and then the price started tanking and uh, in the ensuing days you saw that like uh, there was like a difference between like uh, certain protocols and others. Uh, for example, like uh, Frax had this mechanism that kind of like multiplied the interest rate that was charged every four hours. And basically like uh, in 24 hours, uh, the rate multiplied by 1.87. And so what would happen basically is like, uh, um, <coughs> no matter the liquidation loan to value that you had, if it's like different from one, one market to the other, one is growing the debt faster than the other. And so they're gonna be first at the liquidation. Um, and so if that happens, the liquidity conditions change completely, right? And usually the fancy models at that point tell you that uh, CRV is worth the zero, right? And <laughs> like, uh, that's not something that you want to rely on. Um, and that's not necessarily something that you want to act on. So um, on these machine learning model stuff and everything, I think like uh, really like best practices go a long way. Uh, just use simple explainable math for the core of the protocol and for whatever is like really complex, uh, keep it like outside on the edges and with a time lock, ideally. And yeah, it should be fine. Uh, yeah, I, I think that um, sort of uh, understanding Gauntlet's like <laughs> position in the space to, uh, yeah, we, we sort of spent a lot of time working on uh, ML models, sort of, yeah, stochastic models to understand various situations. I actually yeah, really appreciate Cal's approach here too because uh, it doesn't matter how complex or how sort of nuanced your model is if you can't explain it, if you don't know uh, what you're doing. Also, uh, the next step of, uh, yeah, I think I, I don't want to front run the, the presentation afterwards, but doing s calculations on chain, understanding how to fold that into actual protocols, uh, that's sort of a whole other conversation. But um, yeah, uh, <laughs> developing uh, interest rate models that have specific probabilistic functions. Uh, we actually published a paper recently about um, how you can arbitrage specific uh, uh, 
protocol mechanism designs in specific ways because of the information you have about uh, how it's built. Uh, but yeah, uh, to, to simply answer your question, um, it's, it, oh yeah, uh, there, there are considerations, there are trade-offs. Understanding how to use the information regardless of the model you use, regardless of the sort of tools and algorithms you use is by far the most important piece. And so I think that uh, a lot of the conversation around this too might be focused on the wrong things. You actually care the most about the inputs and the outputs, uh, how you get there, the methods are many and, and uh, yeah. Okay. Um, would you like to talk about the cousin? No, all good? Okay. <laughs> Uh, we have, I guess, like four minutes left on our session. Uh, I have still some good questions, uh, but uh, okay, uh, just a second. Sorry, I have a brightness issue. <laughs> um, as a like, maybe as a last question, I can ask um, as a clo closure on this uh, discussion here. Um, Okay, so it's more like uh, about the liquidity interconnectedness and the risk exposure between the multi-protocols, multi-chain, multi-asset environment. Um, uh, due to the time constraints, I just want to like, uh, get a brief answer from all of you. Um, so, sorry. Um, okay, so as I said, uh, for, uh, to give an example, for instance, staked Ethereum is like major liquidity of the Aave, uh, which Lido exposes a risk on the ecosystem in general. Um, how do you perceive and also the assess the risk of this increasing dependency on the DeFi in general with these multi-chain bridges, multi-protocols, multi-assets, and especially these liquid staking solutions that's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, yeah. Uh, sure. So, um, yeah, I think this is like a very big issue. Like, uh, I, I don't feel like there, there's been like a point in finance where like uh, there was like so much atomicity. Like, you can join the protocol in like one transaction, and everything can go to shit in like, uh, sorry, pardon my French, uh, in like 30 seconds, right? Um, I think it's like a very hard issue to tackle. Like, uh, you, you can rely on models for liquidity and that type of stuff, but usually when uh, stuff gets really bad, your models are pretty much wrong. Uh, I think like one solution really is like a good mechanism design. And so basically like a, a circuit breakers where it fits and where uh, the consequences are in the understandable and clear. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, now that three years in uh, from the DeFi summer, it uh, just gets more and more complex and uh, there are different layers of risks that uh, uh, a user is facing when interacting with any of these platforms basically uh, and th definitely the first thing that has to be done is uh, the centralization especially with a light example has to be uh, has to stay in the past has to be like uh, built through and i think the team is doing a great job at that and uh, they're like heads down to achieve that as soon as possible because well, ultimately, it's a big, big chunk of the ecosystem, huge chunk of the ecosystem, and uh, I think it will be one of those kind of s successful survivals. Hope, hopefully, that will add a lot of credibility uh, to the whole ecosystem, and I think will also drive a lot of uh, liquidity. Uh, but generally speaking, yeah, it just has to be kind of uh, dissolved layer by layer. Uh, yeah, it, with regards to, to staked assets and uh, like mitigating risk there, uh, our team actually published something in the Aave forums uh, relatively recently. Um, it's a sort of an Oracle mechanism uh, modulator, I guess you could call it. It's called a kill switch uh, Oracle implementation. Uh, we built this on top of sort of a BGD, uh, the Aave team's uh, idea of how to uh, make specific pieces of their Oracle more efficient. Uh, but succinctly, what we did was uh, define specific logic that you could build in terms of price updates from different chains and different liquidity sources and how you want that to interact with the protocol and have specific conditions uh, uh, and triggers uh, sort of atomic, atomically built in, right? Uh, that's, that's sort of one approach too, given sort of how much staked assets are on, 
on various protocols. Um, another thing I would add as well, I don't know if we uh, sort of announced this uh, engagement, but we're also working on sort of liquidation mechanism designed for cross-chain uh, <laughs> assets, lending and borrowing. And so, uh, yeah, again, uh, yeah, read, look at our website, sort of read the analysis we publish. But I think uh, with those things, there's, there's sort of a lot of things to be built still, uh, it, which is why it's so exciting to work in this space where you have so many toys, so many different uh, ways to think about risk, so many different vectors that could potentially impact uh, a future design. But uh, yeah, don't want to don't want to sound uh, like I'm preaching, but yeah, that's why that's why it's exciting to to work in this space and think about economic risk in in particular ways. But yeah, uh, okay, just like one side note, uh, I think like uh, formalizing like the problem of like uh, the interactions between protocols, like beyond just encoding it like in Python or something, is like a really interesting problem. And so if you're working on that, uh, reach out on Twitter. I think we are out of our, our time. Um, I thank all our uh, participants, to both the audience and the speaker uh, today with us. Um, thanks, I guess. <laughs>